In any case, I'm going to actually talk about um, diagnosis of IBS. And um, this is, the title sort of implies to you, I put in 2012, because this is very much a work in progress. And the, the talk that we're giving in 2012 is pretty different than the talk we were giving five years ago. So um, I'll lead you through the evidence, at least as I see it, uh, at the current time. I think we have to start with symptom-based criteria because IBS remains and will continue to be for the foreseeable future a symptom-based diagnosis. So if we utilize the Rome 3 criteria as our jump point in terms of understanding the diagnosis of IBS, the Rome 3 criteria require the presence of abdominal pain or discomfort, and, and the, that abdominal pain has three typical features. One is that it oftentimes will improve with defecation. The onset is oftentimes associated with a change in stool frequency or a, different, or a change in stool form. And it's important to re remember that there has to be some degree of chronicity. Patients that have symptoms for a week or two do not qualify for the diagnosis of IBS. After all, um, all of us get symptoms transiently, um, abdominal pain, altered bowel habits, and I don't think that we would all, we would, we would all be diagnosed with IBS. In fact, if, you're, if you think about what Lynn talked about in terms of post-infectious um, many, many patients develop symptoms for short periods of time after an acute infection has cleared. Um, so there needs to be some degree of chronicity. In addition, from a practical standpoint, there's this varied phenotype. So everybody with IBS has abdominal pain or discomfort, but then there will also be, uh, there will also be this diversity of bowel-related complaints. So patients that have more constipation-related complaints, more diarrhea-related complaints, and then this very confusing group of patients that has a mixture of both diarrhea and constipation-related complaints, which, by the way, uh, from Lynn's work, work from Europe as well, um, appear to, appears to be the largest subgroup of IBS, patients with this mixed category. Um, and I will say that a lot of that mixed business is probably related to things that we do to the patient. In other words, when you give a patient with IBSC a laxative therapy and they come back you know, six or eight weeks later, and they say, now I'm having some diarrhea and constipation. They're not really mixed. They're really IBSC patients who you've made mixed by giving them laxative therapy. And that's just an important thing to remember as you're seeing patients in clinic because a lot of times the phenotype, the clinical phenotype, is confounded by what has been done previously by physicians before the patient has been referred to you. Um, now, realize that these subgroups do change over time. So, some have argued that dynamism is really part and parcel to the diagnosis of IBS, that, um, that really classic IBS tends to move from, from one category to another over time. Um, the biggest migration is really from diarrhea predominance or constipation predominance to that middle ground, um, with less often patients truly swinging or alternating between IBSC and IBSD. It does happen but not as often as patients migrating into that middle ground. And again, I would argue that some of that migration is really iatrogenic. Lynn talked to you about pathophysiology, so we're not going to spend any time going over that, except to say that the heterogeneity of the pathogenesis, which Lynn so nicely summarized for you over the last 20 minutes, really underlies the challenges in regards to making a diagnosis of IBS, and probably even more so in the next talk, choosing therapy for patients with IBS. So really when you talk about IBS over the years, everybody shows you a slide like this. So use symptom-based diagnostic criteria uh, for IBS and then exclude alarm features or warning signs. And we'll talk briefly about that because it, it's so critically important in terms of stratifying patients, both in terms of the confidence of your diagnosis and also in terms of how aggressive you're going to be in terms of performing diagnostic tests. And then um, uh, doing selected diagnostic testing uh, to exclude the most likely organic conditions that can masquerade as IBS. Then making a confident diagnosis and moving on to empiric therapy based usually on um, the patient's predominant symptoms. Now with regard to alarm features, I think most of you are, are very familiar with this, but just to briefly review, so onset over the age of 50, GI bleeding. Um, nocturnal diarrhea, this is an interesting myth. I don't know how it is in kids, but in adults, you know, people always say nocturnal symptoms. And specifically by that, most people mean nocturnal pain. But it turns out that in a couple of different studies now, nocturnal pain has no discriminative value between functional versus organic disease. On the other hand, nocturnal diarrhea does. And the reason for that is because nocturnal diarrhea suggests a secretory process 
of which IBS is not a pure secretory diarrhea. There may be a mixed um, osmotic secretory picture for some patients with IBS, but for the most part, patients that have a more, um, a more secretory process really should not, you should not conclude out of, the, out of the chute that those patients have IBS. Weight loss, unexplained iron deficiency, anemia, and of course a family history of important organic diseases like colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease. And another thing that you get added onto the list, certainly for kids, is celiac disease. You know, I'm, I'm sure you're probably already on board on this, but, but you know, it's something that really needs to be incorporated in the history right out of the chute. I know that most adult gastroenterologists actually don't ask about this, but um, it's interesting as we start to move into the next section of the talk and talk about celiac disease, actually the prevalence of celiac disease amongst adults with IBS symptoms is not that great, but it's probably, it's, it's likely to be significantly enriched if there's a family history of celiac disease. So one of the factors that should make you more concerned about that diagnosis, make you more attuned to a pursuing that diagnosis, is to specifically ask about the family history, and if there is a family history, go after that particular condition. Uh, the thing to remember about alarm features is that they're mo probably most useful in terms of their negative predictive value. So this, this is a very simple way to think about this. A lot of patients, Bill Whitehead has shown us from analysis from the UNC database, a lot of patients with IBS symptoms are going to have at least one warning sign or alarm feature. But the reality is that most, the vast majority of those patients with a warning sign or alarm feature are going to have a negative workup and still end up with a diagnosis of IBS. So where warning signs and alarm features help you is in two things. One is it helps to identify a group that you should be more aggressive about investigating, acknowledging that most of those patients are still going to end up with a diagnosis of IBS. And probably the most important thing is patients that have none of those warning signs are very likely to have IBS, and it's, it's probably not of much value to pursue aggressive diagnostic testing in that population. All right, so... What do you find if you do diagnostic testing in patients with IBS? Well, this is a compilation of data from a systematic review and meta-analysis that um, was performed originally in 2002 and then updated in 2009. And the bottom line here is that the things that we worry about as physicians are the things that are most likely to be found in patients with IBS symptoms and no warning signs or alarm features. So um, there infrequently you will identify a colon cancer or inflammatory bowel disease in a patient with IB, classic IBS symptoms and no warning signs or alarm features. But the likelihood of identifying that diagnosis in a person with typical IBS symptoms and no warning signs or alarm features is no different than if I took everybody in this room and did the same set of procedures on them. Okay, so um, uh, you very rarely find those conditions in patients with IBS. And for that reason, uh, it, it amplifies that point that I just made a moment ago. Patients with classic IBS symptoms, no warning signs or alarm features, don't need a lot of routine, and I emphasize that word, routine diagnostic testing. Now, two possible exceptions for that might be celiac disease, and we'll talk about that more in a minute, as well as um, carbohydrate malabsorption, and in particular, lactose intolerance. So let's go through the data for those two things. First off is there is data from three case control studies to suggest that lactose intolerance may be more frequent on the basis of abnormal breath testing um, in patients with IBS symptoms compared to controls. But realize that it's three case control studies, not prospective studies, um, and they're fairly small studies. So uh, this is not the most robust of data sets, and I think it may not even be the right question. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Well, Lynn talked to you about fermentation as a possible pathophysiological variable that might explain symptoms in patients with IBS. Um, she also talked about alterations in motility and visceral perception. Well, think about this. If you have a patient that has lactase deficiency in the brush border of the small intestine, and for that reason, they malabsorb or maldigest lactose, and it gets to the colon where it's fermented, producing gas, and a large load of short-chain fatty acids. Wouldn't it make sense to think that that physiological phenomenon would be more likely to cause symptoms in a person with underlying abnormalities in motility and visceral perception compared to somebody that had no such abnormalities at all? And in fact, that's probably true. There are two um, small studies now to suggest that um, if you give poorly absorbed carbohydrates, and by the way, it doesn't have to be lactose, 
to IBS patients, they are much more likely to develop symptoms in the face of maldigestion or malabsorption than individuals that don't have IBS. And I'll finish my comment on this by saying this. There are lots of patients that maldigest lactose, right? But most people aren't symptomatic related that, to that or are only minimally symptomatic. The diff I think the difference is for IBS patients is that physiologic phenomenon, it, the symptoms or consequences are amplified related to their underlying abnormalities in pathophysiology. All right, and um, with regard to celiac disease, uh, celiac disease, there is, there is data to suggest from a meta-analysis that we published in the archives now a couple of years ago uh, that biopsy-proven celiac disease is more likely in IBS patients compared to controls. The um, problem with this particular meta-analysis is that of the five studies, only one is from the United States. And you can probably figure out which one it is from the United States. The one thing I'll say about the one study from the United States, if you look at this, this, in this preliminary meta-analysis, is that it's negative. It did not find an increased prevalence of celiac disease um, amongst IBS patients. Now, if you look at the data that's available from the U.S., there are two studies. One is a case control study, a retrospective study from Olmstead County that showed a slight increase in the absolute prevalence of celiac disease amongst IBS patients versus controls, but was not statistically significantly different. So 1% versus 0.5%. And then um, the second one is a prospective study, a multicenter study that we conducted uh, in the U.S. and actually published in gastroenterology late last year. And that study, again, showed no increase in, this, in, no increase in the likelihood of biopsy-proven celiac disease amongst IBS patients versus controls. So the data that we have from the United States, interestingly enough, actually does not support the contention that celiac disease is more common amongst IBS patients than controls. Now, does that mean that we shouldn't look for it? No, I think we should absolutely still look for it because we have a very clear um, therapy for that that's, com that's quite different than for most garden variety patients with IBS. In addition, um, the case control study from Old State County suggests that the prevalence might be as high as 1%, which does reach the threshold for being cost effective in terms of screening for IBS patients in general. But I think the take home message is as you screen for celiac disease, just realize that you're going to be doing a lot of testing and not finding a lot of celiac disease. That's just the reality of it. Now, um, one other tidbit that I'll just throw out there that's uh, a sort of raging area of controversy. Uh, both in the celiac world as well as the IBS world right now, is the fact that while biopsy-proven celiac disease is quite infrequent, 1% or less amongst IBS patients, the presence of celiac antibodies is much more prevalent amongst IBS patients. It's prevalent in some controls as well. I don't want to make it sound like it's markedly different between IBS patients versus controls. But realize that in our study that we just published, 7% of the IBS cohort actually had at least one abnormal celiac antibody test, most of which were anti-gliadin antibodies. Um, now, the question, that, the question is, what does that mean? Okay, and, and one of the things that's been suggested by a group in Germany um, and also sort of corroborated by our analysis as well is that that group of individuals um, uh, may still respond to a gluten-free diet. And in fact, if you do HLA testing in that population, individuals with po positive HLA haplotypes and um, uh, positive serology but a normal biopsy could also have latent, uh, latent forms of celiac disease that just haven't manifest yet in terms of histology. So um, there's much to be learned about that group. Uh, I think right now we're characterizing those patients as, amongst others as possibly suffering with non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which is a very, very interesting group of individuals for which a gluten-free diet seems to offer benefit. All right, so uh, at the current time, I still think it's worthwhile to pursue serological screening for celiac disease amongst patients with diarrhea and mixed IBS. TTG and EMA are probably going to be your most specific uh, and most sensitive bets in terms of doing serological screening. Um, and then there's this, this other issue about patients with a positive celiac serology test but normal small bowel biopsies and whether those patients may represent a population uh, that suffers with non-celiac gluten sensitivity and might benefit from a gluten-free diet. Separate discussion, but an interesting discussion. And then finally, we'll finish up with a couple comments on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, because this is another hugely contested, argued area uh, in IBS research at the current time. And so um, remember that 
there, that the main way by which we identify small intestinal bacterial overgrowth in clinical practice is through the use of breath tests, carbohydrate breath tests. And this concept is predicated upon giving an oral carbohydrate substrate and upon interaction between that substrate and the bacteria in the GI tract, presumably in the small intestine in the, in the setting of SIBO, there will be release of hydrogen and methane gas that is eventually expelled in the breath where you can measure it. And so an increase in breath hydrogen or methane excretion in the breath after ingestion of the carbohydrate substrate suggests the presence of bacterial overgrowth. Now, there are two different tests. One is the lactulose breath test and the other one is the glucose breath test. Um, lactulose gets all the way through the small intestine and almost always gets to the, really always gets to the colon. And so if you think about it, if you have bacterial overgrowth anywhere in the small bowel, you're going to pick it up. So lactulose is sensitive, but here's the problem is that lactulose always gets to the colon. So depending upon whether you have fast or slow transit, you're going to see an increase in breath hydrogen or methane excretion in the breath either sooner or later. But the point is, when you see an increase in breath hydrogen or methane excretion in the breath, it's never completely clear whether that represents bacterial overgrowth in the small intestine or whether it simply represents orocecal transit, that is the substrate getting to the colon. Glucose, on the other hand, is rapidly absorbed in the small bowel, so it never gets to the distal small bowel. The, the good news about that is that a positive glucose breath test almost always means the person has bacterial overgrowth. The bad news about that is that if a person has bacterial overgrowth that predominantly affects the, small, the distal part of the small bowel, you will not diagnose it with a glucose hydrogen breath test. So therefore, glucose is the exact opposite of lactulose, and that is it's specific but not sensitive. And so the bottom line here is, unfortunately, we really don't have a great non-invasive means of diagnosing SIBO. Now, with that as a backdrop, let me tell you a couple things, and then we'll close up. The first thing is that um, there is some emerging evidence to suggest that there may be a higher likelihood of SIBO in patients with IBS. This is largely predicated upon studies that have utilized, utilized breath testing with all of the attendant problems that I just outlined for you a few moments ago. There is, however, some more recent data using small bowel aspiration, specifically aspiration of the duodenum and jejunum, and then quantitative culture. This first study is by Poserud and colleagues published a few years ago in gut that found that if you use a traditional cutoff of um, greater, than, uh, greater than 10 to the... Uh, 10 to the fifth colony forming units of bacteria per milliliter of aspirate from the jejunum that there was no increased likelihood of SIBO amongst IBS patients versus controls. But that if you lowered that threshold to greater than five times 10 to the third colony forming units per milliliter, there was a, um, a statistically significant difference in the likelihood of finding SIBO amongst IBS patients versus controls. This has actually recently been um, confirmed by by Mark Pimentel's group, who did um, quantitative culture of aspirates from the duodenum and again found an increased likelihood or an increased um, uh, um, uh, likelihood of contamination of the proximal small bowel with bacteria in IBS patients confer, con compared to non IBS controls. So there is, I think it's an interesting hypothesis that there may be, maybe it's not flagrant um, SIBO as we've defined it previously by quantitative um, small bowel aspiration, but maybe there are greater levels of contamination with, um, with bacteria in IBS patients versus controls. IBS remains a symptom-based diagnosis in 2012. Uh, selected diagnostic testing is, uh, I think, appropriate for things like celiac sprue, lactose intolerance, as well as um, microscopic colitis, which I didn't, didn't discuss, but we can certainly talk about later. Um, further investigations to understand the pathogenesis of IBS are warranted because I, I think at the end of the day, until we combine symptom-based diagnostic criteria with biomarkers to help subgroup patients on the basis of pathophysiology, we're going to continue to be left with these empiric treatment strategies which are likely to only yield therapeutic gains of 10 to 15 percent over placebo. So, Ironically, the way forward, in, in my opinion, in terms of developing highly effective therapies is going to be largely predicated upon um, more accurate diagnosis, which involves biomarkers and subgroups patients on the basis of pathophysiology. So with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention.